the probability online seminar. Um, so as you'll see, everyone's currently, well, almost everyone is currently muted. Um, if you have questions during the talk, um, you can ask them in the chat. Uh, a lot of the time these get answered in the chat, but uh, Christina and I will monitor and uh, if it seems that any interruption is needed, we'll ask the questions directly to the speaker. Otherwise, they can be asked at the end. Okay, so uh, this week it's a great pleasure to have Liana Yepremian, who's going to talk on Riser's conjecture and more. Hello everyone, can you hear me well? Okay, great. Um, it's a pleasure to um, have this opportunity to give this talk. So thank you, Alex and Christina for this. Um, okay, so I'll talk about uh, joint, recent joint work with um, Peter Kivash, Alexey Pakrovsky and Benny Sutakov. Um, so, I'm sure most of you heard about um, Latin squares, but let me just remind you the definition. A Latin square for the n is an n by n square filled with cells. Um, the cells are filled with n symbols such that every um, symbol appears only once in each row and once in each column. A transversal of order k in a Latin square is a set of k cells from distinct rows and distinct columns containing only distinct symbols. When k is n, we call such a transversal a full transversal. And here uh, on the right, you can see a picture of um, Latin square of size four by four. Uh, and on the diagonal, we actually see a full transversal because this uh, four cells, uh, they don't share any rows or columns and even more, uh, inside them you see all distinct symbols. Uh, I'm seeing some chat, so, okay, um, sorry. Now a conjecture by, um, Reiser, Rualdi and Stein, so they conjectured this in various forms and uh, at various times, but I will just call it riser rualdi stein conjecture. Uh, it says that every n by n Latin square must have a transversal of size n minus one, even more if n is odd, it must have a full transversal. Um, so let me first say, mention something that the second sentence cannot happen if n is uh, even. Why? Because there are actually uh, Latin squares of even order which do not have a full transversal. The simplest example is if you take the Cayley table of Z2, um, more general examples if you take uh, the Cayley table of uh, the group Z2K. Um, and there are even more complicated examples coming from uh, group theory. Um, okay, so, well, when we can't prove a conjecture, we try to say what, what sort of things can we prove? And um, the natural question is, what size of transversals are we guaranteed to always have? And here's some history of what uh, was known before we started working on this. Uh, maybe let me mention that uh, the first asymptotic result was obtained in 78 by two group of people, uh, Brouwer, Devry, and Biaringa, and also Woolbright, who proved that every Latin square is guaranteed to have a transversal of order n minus square root n. Um, <clears throat> later in 82, Peter Shore um, published a paper where uh, he showed that in every Latin square, you can find transversals of order n minus uh, of log square n. Um, when Puya Hatami was a uh, student, I believe, in Iran, he actually read this paper and found a mistake. And um, they, together with Peter Short, they fixed it. And uh, so the, the, the current best bound is n minus of log square n. Uh, so what do we bring to this picture? We show that actually every Latin square uh, of order n uh, must have a transversal of order n minus uh, of log n over log log n. Now, um, 
yeah, I see a chat. I will share the slides after the talk. I'm sorry. Um, so, um, right. So now let me draw some connection from uh, between Latin squares and uh, graphs. So, because most of this talk will be in the language of uh, graphs. Um, so, for every uh, Latin square of order n, we can actually associate uh, the following uh, colored graph. We take, um, that basically is the complete bipartite graph, where on one side you take all the rows, and on the other side of the bipartition, the verses are the columns, and you uh, color the edge ij, uh, so you color the edge ij by the color that appears uh, in that cell. So here I have four colors and the symbol, uh, and the symbol one is the red, symbol two is blue, three is the yellow, and four is uh, the color green. So if I look at the cell, <clears throat> say, one one that I know that it's filled with symbol one so I will color this edge uh, which goes from row one to column one by color red okay so this is the correspondence uh, and what is a transversal in a Latin square what does it correspond to in this complete bipartite graph well it just has to be a rainbow matching where rainbow matching means that no two edges share the same uh, color. Indeed, why is it so? Because uh, in a transversal, uh, you all the, uh, all the cells come from distinct rows and columns, which in this uh, picture, in the graph theoretic picture, it means that they don't share any vertices. It means that uh, they have to be, like those edges have to induce a matching. And then because the cells are all containing distinct symbols, that means that the colors have to be distinct. So I hope I convinced you that uh, the conjecture of Reisel, Rural, Liechtenstein can also be stated in uh, the following language, which says that every properly edge colored KNN contains a rainbow matching of size n minus one. Moreover, if n is odd, it has a perfect rainbow matching. Um, I, I forgot to mention that indeed it's a proper edge coloring because um, uh, because if you look at any vertex, that means that you are looking at this row and you are seeing all distinct symbols in Latin square, which means that in, in, in this KNN, you are seeing all distinct uh, colored edges coming out of each vertex. So indeed, it's a proper edge coloring. Okay, so in this language, what we prove is that every properly n edge colored complete bipartite graph KNN has a rainbow matching of size n minus of log n over log log n. Okay, so uh, now once again, uh, I will go to another setting and I will draw some connections uh, between Latin squares and uh, hypergraphs and transversals in Latin squares and matchings in hypergraphs. So suppose, again, we are given an n by n Latin square filled with symbols from one to the n. Let's construct the following hypergraph H. So we take VH to be uh, the set of rows, columns, and symbol, symbols of the Latin square. And it's going to be a tripartite hypergraph. So for every row uh, I and the column J and symbol S, I will put IJS to be an hyperedge if the ij entry of the Latin square has symbol s. It takes uh, a moment to realize that, okay, indeed h is a three uniform hypergraph and it has the property that every pair of vertices lying in different parts is in exactly one edge. In other words, h is a tripartite Steiner triple. So what, what was a Steiner triple? It's a three uniform hypergraph, say on n vertices, such that any two uh, vertices are containing exactly one edge. The uh, only uh, restriction we have here is that the edge that we derive from Latin square is tripartite. Okay, um, so what do we know about matchings uh, in this 
graph H, it's not hard to see that a matching of certain size in H, so a, a matching of size K in the hypergraph H uh, is in one-to-one -one correspondence to, uh, with a transversal of size K. Because when you have matchings, um, matching in the graph H, those IgJSs are all distinct. And that just one by one goes, um, translates to having uh, cells in the Latin square, which all have distinct rows, columns, and symbols. Okay. Now that we have seen that there is this correspondence between transversals of Latin squares and matchings of this hypergraph, let me uh, tell you about the conjecture of Brouwer, which is from 1981. And it says the following, that every Steiner triple system of order n contains a matching of size n minus four over three. This conjecture, uh, uh, there has been uh, some work on it, and the best bound, uh, so the first asymptotic bound was again obtained by Brouwer in 81, who proved that um, every such Steiner triple system contains a matching of order n over 3 minus um, n to the two-thirds, and the best current, uh, the current best known bound is by Alan Kim and Spencer who proved that uh, we are guaranteed to have a matching of size n over 3 minus uh, square root n times some polylog factor. Um, and we add, the, uh, we add something from, to this picture. We show that um, indeed uh, we can obtain the same error term as I mentioned before in this conjecture as well. So we can show that every Steiner triple system on n vertices must have a matching of size at least n over three minus of log n over log log n. Um, indeed, uh, in the previous um, picture, I had that Latin squares are in correspondence with tripartite Steiner triple systems but we are able to um, go around that tripartite uh, condition and prove this theorem. Okay, so, uh, so far I have given you uh, kind of three settings. The first one was um, finding large transversal in n by n Latin squares filled with symbols from one to the n. The second one was finding large rainbow matchings in properly edge colored complete bipartite graph KNN. And the third one was large matchings in linear tripartite Steiner systems. Um, and our proof setting is going to be in the set, setting number two. And actually, uh, more generally, we work uh, uh, in, in this settings where uh, either we find large transversal in n by n Latin arrays, where Latin array is defined just as Latin square, except the number of symbols that you are allowed to use in the square is not necessarily n, but any number m, which is at least n. And uh, the second setting is <clears throat> finding large rainbow matchings in colored quasi-random graphs. And I'm sure most of you heard the word quasi-random already, but I will today talk about what it means to be colored quasi-random. And the third setting is large matchings in tri tri tripartite three uniform linear hypergraphs. Okay, from now on, I will talk about the second setting. Okay, <clears throat> what, uh, what, is a, what is a graph which I call typical? These are maybe more known in the literature as quasi-random graphs, but I will use the word typical. Um, so a graph is typical if it behaves like a random graph of the same edge density. So, <clears throat> so this is uncolored version so far. Uh, we call a bipartite graph G, say with parts x, y, where x and y have size n, epsilon, p, n typical if the degrees are around p, n for every vertex p and for any pair of vertices coming from the same bipartition class, so either from x or y, their co-degrees are around p square n. So you might notice here that the degrees or the co-degrees are allowed to, um, uh, to uh, be different from uh, Pn by about some uh, subpolynomial 
uh, error, n to the 1 minus epsilon. In general, quasi-random graphs don't have to be such a strong condition on how big the error can be. It can be just little law of n. Um, but uh, for our purposes, we will require that this typicality is quite strong, meaning that we only allow um, subpolynomial uh, uh, variance between, between uh, the degrees. Okay, um, so I defined uh, for you what is just general typicality without colors. So now let me define what it means for a graph to be color typical. So again, we are given a graph G, which is bipartite and parts X and Y, and I will call it colored epsilon P and typical if in addition to the previous two conditions, also this, the following two conditions hold. Okay, it might look a bit technical, but um, let me just give you the message that what this P3 and P4 are telling us is that the colors uh, behave like as if the colors were random on the graph. So the first one just says that for every color that appears in the graph G, the number of times you see this color on the edges is again around Pn. And the second condition says, if I look at any two colors, C and C prime, and if I look at all the vertices in X, which are adjacent to edges of both colors, then the number of such vertices in X is the same and it's around P square N. And it's the same if you look at the other, uh, at the vertices on the other side in Y. So again, we won't use these conditions <clears throat> today. I just really wanted to give you a flavor of what color typicality means. Uh, but I will try to uh, give the talk mostly about just a complete graph canon, which is indeed epsilon PN typical. Okay, so um, I said previously that I will talk about large matchings in color typical graphs. And let's first see what's known at all about uh, matchings in such graphs. Um, so, sorry, it's a result by Frankel and Trottel, which goes back to 1985, and also by Pippinger and Tibetanetli, which was an unpublished work, that if you, um, uh, look at epsilon pn regular graphs, then they all have a rainbow matching of order uh, one minus little o of one times n. So what's, um, what's colored regular graph? So basically we remove the, uh, the conditions p2 and p4. Uh, so remember p2 was saying that the co-degrees behave like in the random graph and also p4 was saying that pairs of colors uh, behave uh, nicely. So we remove those conditions. That means that we only require that every vertex has degree around Pn, and we ask that every color appears around Pn times. Such a graph is called colored regular. And the result of Frankel and Trodel, and also of Pippinger, uh, it was the first in, in this flavor, which shows that these graphs do have large rainbow matchings of order n minus little of n. In fact, there has been a lot of work on this type of problems, and at this point, there are better uh, results known in the literature where this little o one term can be taken to be uh, something like n to the minus gamma for some small gamma, which, uh, which gives us a subpolynomial uh, error in the matching. So we get matchings of size n minus n to the one minus gamma. So what's our <coughs> contribution then? Uh, well, well, what we do is that by adding the uh, stronger restriction of typicality on the graph G instead of regularity, we can obtain much larger matchings. So we show that if G is a colored typical bipartite graph, then it has a rainbow matching of size n minus of log n over log log n. Um, and let's see that this result actually um, already implies one of our <clears throat> results, the first one I mentioned, uh, immediately. Indeed, the complete bipartite graph KNN is typical, epsilon PN typical, if you take P to be one and epsilon can be anything. Because all the degrees are N, um, so, and all the co-degrees are also N, all the, every color appears exactly, um, 
n times because I was assuming that KNN is colored by exactly n colors. So indeed, from the first theorem, we obtain um, that um, every properly n edge colored KNN has a rainbow matching of size n minus of log n over log log n immediately. Our second result, uh, which was the result on Steiner systems and uh, how large of matchings we can find there, uh, it's not immediate, but it's not, uh, we, we just need to do slightly more work by first doing some random sampling. <clears throat> okay, so um, basically my concentration for the rest of the talk then will be this theorem about uh, finding uh, large rainbow matchings in the color typical bipartite graphs. And I will try to give you a flavor of how do we prove this result. Okay. Um, so this is the theorem I'm going to talk about and try to give a sketch of a proof. Uh, in fact, I will try to give the sketch when G is just a complete graph K and N and the size of the matching is just n minus of log n rather than n minus of log n over log log n, um, just for simplicity. So to uh, talk about the proof, let me first uh, uh, remind you what Rodol's nibble is. So Rodol used um, this technique in, um, I think in around 1985 uh, and um, he was, uh, he solved the uh, Erdos Hanani conjecture where, and he did that by showing that regular hypergraphs uh, with bounded codigrees have nearly perfect matchings. So um, let me try to give you uh, an idea how we could apply Rodolf's nibble to show the existence of rainbow matching of size n minus of n to the one minus epsilon in a properly n edge colored complete bipartite graph KNN. So what we do is the following. First, uh, we, we fix some alpha between zero and one and select every edge of KNN with probability alpha over n. Then we delete all the edges which share vertices or colors with other selected edges. This will definitely give us a rainbow matching of size. Um, this will definitely give us a rainbow matching it's not clear that the size will be roughly alpha n because we deleted some edges after the first initial selection, but you can show that it will be roughly of size alpha n. So these collisions, these edge and uh, vertex collisions won't affect the size too much. And then, so this is uh, something which I'll call the first byte. Um, and then what you do is you just keep repeating this. So you repeatedly take bytes and delete vertices and colors from each byte from the rest of the graph to obtain a matching uh, until the remainder is less uh, of size, uh, less than n to the one minus epsilon. So why can you actually do this? Why is it possible to repeat this process? The reason why you can do this is first notice that after the first byte, the graph you get is no longer complete bipartite graph. But it actually, uh, one can prove because the origin, the matching at each byte we, uh, we find is random, we can show that the remaining graph is colored regular. And that allows us to do these repetitions. Okay, um, so what's our new idea? Uh, so our new idea is that we can show that this matching that you obtain by Rodol's nibble has nice pseudo-random properties with respect to colors which allows us to further modify the matching M uh, until the remainder is uh, of order log N. And these modifications that I'm talking about, they are deterministic, okay? So first you find a nice matching uh, via Rodol nibble, you prove some nice properties, some nice pseudo-random properties with respect to colors that this matching has, and then we will be able to do these modifications to increase M further. In fact, we mostly went, in our proofs, we work with the first byte. So we only prove these conditions hold for M zero, this pseudo random properties. And then they extend to M naturally because M is just an extension of the first byte. Um, 
So indeed, so the second, uh, this slide is just repeating what I just said, that we first obtain an M0 rainbow matching by selecting every edge with probability alpha over n and then deleting all vertex and color collisions. Uh, <clears throat> and we prove that this M0 has nice expansion properties. Um, then we extend M0 to a larger ma matching, a matching of size n minus n to the one minus epsilon via Rodos nibble. And here we just do this via black box. We don't, we don't do this bytes by ourselves. And uh, then as, at the third step, we will do some uh, argument, uh, arguments called switching tab arguments. I'll talk more about this later. And I'll show how we increase M as long as we have log N unused colors outside of the matching. And we will do this iteratively. At each step, we'll obtain a rainbow matching of size mi plus one. So mi is at step i, um, my matching, and at the next step, mi plus one will be of size mi plus one. But we will do this, <clears throat> uh, this uh, modifications in such a way that the edit distance between each mi and mi plus one is not big, which will eventually also result that uh, the added distance between each mi and the original m is not big, which would mean that all those nice expansion properties I'm talking about actually keep being satisfied for mi as well. Okay, more on this later. Um, and we'll iterate this to step S3 n to the one minus epsilon times, and we get a matching with remainder at most log n. Okay. Now, first, let me talk about uh, what sort of pseudo-random properties this random matching has. Well, this one's I called expansion. Okay, <clears throat> so suppose we are given a complete bipartite graph KNN with bipartition XY. Now, for any matching of KNN and the set of D colors, I will say that DM as a pair is an expander if every vertex at S lying in X or in Y of size roughly N over D, it's fourth neighborhood, uh, which is I call here it N D M D M S, is almost um, N. So it's N minus little of N. So what's this neighborhood really? So instead of giving you the technical uh, definition and scare you, let me just go to this picture and show what I mean. So I take a set S of size roughly N over D. Now, in the first step, I, so the, the, <clears throat> I follow uh, pink edges, which will be the edges uh, that are of colors that come from D. So I will look at all the edges that are coming out of S and those edges have colors that appear in the set D. And this I will call the neighborhood of S in D, NDS, okay? Then in the second step, I, uh, I match those vertices via the edges of M. Notice that there might be some uh, vertices here which are unmatched, okay? Because uh, our M isn't complete, but I, I don't have that in the picture. In this uh, third step, now again, I will only allow myself to uh, follow the edges of colors uh, that come from D, so the pink edges again. And the fourth neighborhood will be defined everything that's matched via M. So finally, I start from some S in X and I, it's fourth neighborhood, it's fourth, uh, sorry, it's fourth DM alternating neighborhood is defined to be this set here, uh, again in X, such that if you look at any vertex in this neighborhood, there is an alternating path that goes to um, that goes to S, such that the edges are alternating between D and M. And what expansion is asking is that um, this fourth alternating neighborhood is almost all of X. Or if you start with a set in Y, with S in Y, it's almost all of Y. Um, so uh, I will, uh, in a second, I will tell you how this expansion actually 
uh, gives us nice uh, rainbow paths between vertices, between pairs of vertices in, uh, in the graph. Um, here, just one slight note is that, in fact, our expansion is slightly more technical. Instead of asking for the set of sides around n over d, uh, having this fourth neighborhood to be large, we actually ask that every such S has a subset of smaller size, which is of size around n over d squared, which has that property. So this is um, here, S prime is this red bubble. So I want this expansion that's happening here, the responsible, uh, to find a smaller set inside S, which is responsible for this expansion. This is just for some technical uh, reasons in our proofs. Okay. Um, so what we can actually prove is that the matching M that I described to you, uh, we find by Rodolf Siebel, that was just finding first a small matching M zero by selecting every edge with some probability alpha over N and deleting all edge and vertex collisions and then extending it to a larger matching of size n minus n to the one minus gamma via Rodolf's label, then this matching m has the property that for any set of colors d, dm is going to be an expander. And um, so this is uh, probably our main uh, technical lemma in the, in the proof of, uh, in our proofs. Uh, I will not give you uh, the proof of this, but let me just mention that while we prove this lemma, we mostly analyze the properties of M0. It's only when we go to the fourth neighborhood, from third neighborhood to the fourth neighborhood, we use uh, the whole M. Okay, so uh, now let's see how do we obtain uh, this rainbow uh, paths that I was talking about. So, <clears throat> Indeed, these expansion properties are going to allow us to get short rainbow DM alternating paths between almost all the vertices. And uh, in the applications, you should be thinking about that D is going to be some unused colors. What I mean by that, colors which have not been used on M yet. So I start with a set of size roughly N over D. I go to its first neighborhood and then its second and then third and fourth. In the fourth neighborhood, I see almost all of, um, say if I started with S in X, I see almost all of X here. And indeed for every vertex inside here in this fourth neighborhood, I know there is a DM alternating path of length four, which goes back to, um, uh, back to S. Now, with a bit of work, uh, sorry, we, with uh, a bit of work, you can actually show that most of these paths have to be rainbow. So, by maybe for some little O and fractions of vertices don't have such rainbow paths, but all the rest in this fourth neighborhood, all the rest of those vertices can be um, tracked back to some vertex in S via rainbow paths. In fact, you can even provide that this path can avoid some prescribed set of vertices and, co uh, and colors. This will allow us to iteratively apply this finding rainbow paths. So what do I mean by this? So <clears throat> first um, we can show, so we had some S which had that property that every, uh, every vertex in here had a rainbow path uh, going back to S of length four. I can, by averaging, I can show that there is a smaller set of size around n over d square, such that in its fourth neighborhood, um, if you go via rainbow paths, you reach a set which is of size roughly n over d. So all these vertices here go back to S prime um, via DM alternating rainbow paths. Now you repeat the previous picture I showed to you, which was you go from this set of size n over d to almost <clears throat> all of the graph, okay? So this set n over d in its fourth neighborhood is going to see almost all of, you know, if, if this fourth neighborhood was in x, then this is, this fourth neighborhood is going to be in x as well. 
And what we can do is we can provide that this uh, rainbow paths we are finding in the second step are avoiding all the colors that appear before. So the takeaway message is now we have a set which is of size n over d square instead of having a size n over d such that in its eight neighborhood, almost all vertices here have rainbow paths um, which can be tracked back to S prime and they all alternate between edges of colors D and M. And now we can repeat this process. After repeating it T times, we can show that almost every vertex V in the graph has the following property, that uh, you can reach from V almost all vertices of the graph Via, um, via rainbow paths. What's the length of these paths? They are actually quite short because <clears throat> we apply the previous iteration t times, every time shrinking the size of the set by a factor of d, which means that I have uh, n over d to the t to be around one, so it's one, which implies that t is around log n over log d, which is of order log n over log log n. So this length of the paths here is going to be <clears throat> around that. So of order log n over log log n. So this is nice. And in fact, what it further implies is that if you now look at any pairs of vertices, so here, um, let me see if, uh, somehow I cannot annotate things. Uh, sorry. Uh, I used to be able to draw things here, but somehow it doesn't allow me anymore. Uh, okay. I don't know why. Can you see my mouse? Okay, uh, it's fine. Can you see my mouse? Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, what uh, the previous step implies is that between any two vertices, so x in x and y in y, so x is this thing here, this vertex here, okay, and in this picture y is this, this vertex here, which is adjacent to the brown color, I can find a rainbow dm alternating path between x and y of length, uh, of bounded length, of length at most of log n over log log n. Uh, yes, David, but there's no annotate button, so um, I can't click, but it's okay. Um, I'll, I'll try. Um, now, uh, so this property will allow us to do modifications to our matching gem. Indeed, so imagine these uh, colors I have here, okay, so these D colors are now unused on the matching gem. If, uh, if I knew that this vertex has some edge of unused color going outside, and uh, also this vertex here has an unused uh, colored edge going outside, then what can I do? I can simply flip the edges along this path and increase the matching M, right? So I can just do the following flip. So I make all the blue edges to become known edges of the matching M, I, and I add all those new unused rainbow uh, uh, colored edges to the matching, and I increase the matching M by one. So this would be ideal, but what is the problem? We are not guaranteed to see this purple and this green edge going out and having a color which has been unused so far on the matching M. So typically these edges will actually have colors which are already appearing on the matching. So that's why uh, our proof becomes uh, like our switching arguments are more complicated than uh, just doing simple switching. Okay, and now I will talk about how do we do those switchings. So 
the general goal would be the following. We will still have pictures like this, but this purple edge or this green edge can appear somewhere in the matching. And what we are going to do is we are first going to kick out that, say, green edge is appearing here. I'm going to kick out that green edge from the matching before I do such a switching. This way I will provide that my uh, new matching is still rainbow. Okay, let me show that. So uh, we do some pre-processing before everything starts. We, uh, we take our KNN and we split into three random bits by selecting each color and vertex with probability one third. And then we find the matching M via Rodos symbol as I explained before. So uh, this M has does those nice expansion properties which imply the existence of rainbow paths between any almost all pairs of verses in X and Y. And this M is almost, uh, it's, it's almost spanning. Now, how do we do, uh, how do we increase M? Here's how. So suppose I have a vertex, two vertices here. I was supposed to annotate here as well, but let's, let's just try to use the mouse. So um, suppose I have log and many colors, okay, which are unused uh, on the graph. So this is my G1, this is my G2, and this is my G3. And uh, suppose I have two vertices lying outside of the matching, and I want to try to add uh, some, um, to add those vertices to the matching. What can I do? I am sure to be able to find an edge that goes from this vertex to G1 and this vertex to G2. So now those colors there, they don't have to, be unused as I mentioned before, they can be used somewhere in the matching. However, what I do know for sure is that I can provide that there is a rainbow DM alternating path going from this vertex to this one, such that overall it's resulting in a rainbow alternating DM path. So if I could somehow, so these pink edges, they are all unused in the, in the matching so far. If I can somehow kick out this blue edge and this green edge from the matching, then I will be able to increase my matching by size uh, one. Okay, so what I can provide also is that this green edge appears in the graph G2. How is this done? Uh, this is done via, uh, just by Chernoff bound because of the original random splitting. Um, it's not hard. So you can prove, you can show that this color appears on G2. Uh, I mean, the existence of such an edge, such that the color of that edge appears in G2. Now, of course, here I'm lying a bit, but G2, is not KNN anymore. It's more like a color typical graph, but the same properties as I mentioned before will, uh, will uh, hold, which means that between the vertices of the edge of color C2, I can find a DM alternating path. So here you see a path of length eight and the dashed edges are the edges of the matching and the pink edges are edges that are unused so far on the matching. And you see that there is a cycle now here of length four, which will allow me that if I flip on this, uh, on this cycle, the edges, so I make all the M edges, non M edges, and all the non M edges, M edges, I am still, I still have a rainbow, uh, rainbow matching. Now I do the same for G3. What I can provide is that this first <clears throat> edge I found from this outside vertex going to G1 is of some color C3, which appears on G3. Again, I use the fact that um, M with respect to uh, D is um, an expander, which means that between these two vertices, I can find a DM alternating path of, length, uh, of short length, here it's of length eight, such that if I flip along this cycle, again, I have a rainbow matching. Now, here I didn't, uh, you might wonder, can you actually provide that these colors 
are of size, uh, so, sorry, these colors are disjoint. So the ones I use in G2 and in G3, and the ones I plan to use on, on G1 to flip, are they disjoint? And yeah, yes, you can provide that. Uh, we have log and many colors, and we will just make sure that the colors we use on G2 or G3 or G1 are completely disjoint. And now I think I have given enough ground to believe that if I now do the switching uh, also along the path here, then the graph I get, sorry, the matching I get is rainbow and is of size one bigger than before. Okay, and now we iterate this process, right? So how, long, how much do we change? How, uh, how different is MI? What's the, so here, I'm, by this I mean the symmetric difference, or other, in other words, the edit distance between MI and MI plus one. <clears throat> well, how much did I change? I only changed by the length of this path, and I was guaranteed that the length of those paths are all around of order log n over log log n. So my MI matching, and MI plus one, the matching I get from uh, at, at the step I plus one from modifying MI are not too far from each other. Their distance is around log n over log log n, the same as the order of the paths that I'm using to make those switchings. Now, if I repeat this around n to the one minus epsilon steps, I can provide that the matching I get at i step and the original matching I started with m is bounded by n to the one minus epsilon times log n over log log n, which this number is still much, much less than n, which is, and m was size, remember, around n minus n to the one minus gamma. So I do have that this condition holds. Why do I need this? Because at step i, I want to use expansion properties which are <clears throat> holding for mi. But to hold that, we, I need to make sure that mi is not too far from m. So those properties that I'm talking about, meaning that I can find this DM alternating paths between almost any two vertices also will be satisfied in mi. That's why we can keep doing these iterations. Okay, so, um, and after doing these iterations around uh, log n times, we can, um, we can uh, stop because we found the matching of sides n minus log n. So where, is, where, is it where am I using that I can only do this until I'm left over uh, with log n many uh, vertices outside? It's because this expansion property, which is <clears throat> uh, the, the one I was telling you about, that between any two uh, vertices, I can find this rainbow DM alternating paths. I am using the D's of size log n. So we, we don't know if we can prove such a result for, say, constant number of colors. That's where the restriction of uh, having at least log n colors outside of M, which also translates as having at least log n many vertices outside of M, essential for our proof, of course. Okay. So just a recap what we can prove. So I gave you a proof sketch how we find rainbow matching of size n minus of log n in properly NH colored complete bipartite graph KNN. So what we did here are the steps. First, we obtained an M0 rainbow matching via doing <clears throat> a random sampling. We take every edge with probability alpha f over n for some alpha between zero and one, and we delete all the color and vertex collisions. And we show that this original, this first chunk, this first byte we find M0 has some nice expansion properties, uh, which in other words is some pseudo random properties with respect to the colors. In the second step, we extend this matching M0 to matching of size N minus N to the one minus epsilon by a Rodolf's nibble as a black box. In the third step, after we have proved that those nice expansion properties hold for M0 and thus for M as well, we do switching type arguments to increase M as long as we have log n many unused colors outside of M. We do this iteratively at each step obtaining a rainbow matching of size one bigger than previously, but such that the edit distance between each MI and the original M we, we had 
uh, is still sufficiently small. This guarantees that the properties that we obtained in S1 are still satisfied for MI. And after at most n to the one minus epsilon steps, we do get a matching, which leaves only logarithmic many vertices outside of the matching. <clears throat> so this is the proof sketch. And now let me just <clears throat> once again mention the results we have. So first, we show that every color typical bipartite graph has a rainbow matching of size n minus of log n over log log n. <clears throat> From this result, we can obtain two corollaries. We can show that every properly n edge colored complete bipartite graph has a rainbow matching of size n minus of log n over log log n. With a bit of more, more work, we can show that every Steiner triple system on n vertices has a matching of size at least n over 3 minus of log n over log log n. We actually have further results. We can also show the following. This is very similar to the, to the result on Steiner uh, triples, which we can show that um, if you have a three uniform hypergraph, which is linear, meaning that every pair of edge vertices is containing at most one edge, and it satisfies the following pseudo-random condition, pseudo-randomness conditions. So the first one says that every vertex in this hypergraph, if you look how it behaves in its shadow, meaning this, is an, this one is the neighborhood of the vertex V in the shadow graph, delta H, then it's roughly Pn. And we also ask that for every pair of vertices, uh, so this one is, shouldn't be here. What I mean is that for any pair of vertices U and V, if I look at the neighborhood of U and V in, their shed, in the shadow graph is around P square N. So they, are, they behave like, um, uh, like in the random setting. Then we can find the matching in this hypergraph of size n minus of log n over log log n. This, the proof of this result is very similar uh, to the Steiner triple result. Another uh, uh, result we have is on Latin arrays. So let me just remind you what was Latin array. Latin array is n by n square such that uh, we use say m symbols inside it, not necessarily n, but m at least n, such that every symbol appears at most once in each row and column. So previously it was known that if you have a Latin array filled with n to the two minus epsilon symbols, then you can always find a full transfer. So this was proved by uh, Benny Stutakov, Alexei Pakrovsky, and Richard Montgomery, and also independently by uh, Peter Kivash and myself. With our uh, methods, we can show that much uh, lower number of symbols is sufficient to find a full transversal. That is only constant times n log n over log log n many symbols. Um, Dhruv, I see your question. I think, uh, is it true if we replace p square and just by an upper bound on co-degree like in Frankel and Dhruv? Uh, I don't know, and that's an open question uh, we have. I will talk about it uh, in the next slide. Okay. Uh, okay, so I will finish with some open problems. So first of all, uh, could we get rid of this log n over log, n, log log n error term and get to some absolute constancy? This would be really nice. I mean, uh, to show that um, every Latin square of size n by n always has a transversal of order n minus c for some constant c. Currently, our methods really use the fact that we have this log n many log log n unused colors outside. It's, it's used in this uh, expansion uh, properties we are proving. We don't know if such a thing can be proved with constantly many colors. And the second problem is the same, uh, the same like analogous problem for Steiner uh, triples. So Brouwer's conjecture, meaning can we show that every Steiner triple system has a matching of sets n over three minus a constant for some absolute constant. And finally, <clears throat> this relates to the question of Dhruv. Uh, so we don't know. So what we showed is that all color typical graphs have large rainbow matchings 
of size n minus log n over log log n. But we don't know if it's actually true that you can replace typicality by regularity. So we don't know if typicality is necessary, which relates to this question of truth. In other words, for hypergraphs, you can say, do linear three uniform hypergraphs, which are regular, do they have matching covering all but n to the little o one vertices? So something not polynomial. Um, that's all I think, and thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne. Thank, thank you very much for a lovely talk.